Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Earth Day program here at the Triangle SciTech Expo with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We are so excited to have you here for this um, really cool talk. I'm excited um, for you to hear it. I've heard a little bit of it, and I'm excited to hear more. Um, today, we're going to talk about moving towards zero waste. But before we get started, I just want to um, welcome you again and let you know um, a few tips. We definitely want to hear from you during the program. We wanna hear your comments and your questions. Um, so you can put those in the chat. If you're here in Zoom with us, then you can find that chat right at the bottom and it should pop over to your right side. If you're in YouTube, you also have a chat over to your right. We wanna hear from you there as well. And to get that chat started, I have a question for you. Um, so we're talking about moving towards zero waste. And so I want to know how many pounds of trash does the average American make each day? I want you to throw your guess in there. Um, and if you need some, some guesses, I'll throw out a few numbers. So is it two and a half pounds, four and a half pounds, six and a half pounds, or eight and a half pounds? How much trash does the average American make each day? And of course, all of those numbers are a little bit scary and a little bit too much. So we're gonna learn ways to reduce that, but I wanna see, let's see. Oh, Carrie guessed before I even said anything, she guessed about five pounds. Um, Marianne thinks eight and a half, Tiger thinks eight and a half, eight. Chris thinks about three. Um, so the actual answer is four and a half pounds is the average. And um, from what we can tell, Wake County is right near there, maybe a little bit more. Um, we weren't quite sure on those stats comparing it, but yeah, it's a lot of trash. And so we wanna learn some tips um, on how to reduce that. I know I definitely want to reduce mine. And someone who's an expert at it um, is Lee Williams. So Lee is an RN, a wife and a mom of two who lives here in Cary, North Carolina. Um, she started moving towards zero waste in September of 2015 after reading um, Bea Johnson's book, Zero Waste Home. And so Bea's single jar of trash a year, wow, for a family of four, it didn't seem possible for Leah's family of four, but she knew she could do better and was inspired to try. So she co-founded the nonprofit Toward Zero Waste in 2016. And I know I'm excited to hear how you did it and um, how you're still doing it and um, learn a few tips and tricks along the way. So welcome. Uh, Lee, and I'll let you get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will add that um, I just got some of the latest numbers. Uh, they just had some new numbers come out on that um, average American pounds, and it's actually up to 4.9. So that is, uh, I, I just got that information this morning. Moving in the wrong direction there. That's right. That's right. Despite our efforts. Okay, so about 15 years ago, my husband and I took a scuba diving trip to Koh Tao, Thailand. Now, Koh Tao is a remote and primitive island that you only visit if you're a diver. Our perched hut didn't have power for much of each day, and we were so excited to dive these famed coral reefs with their colorful sea life and crystal blue waters. But on our first dive, something was off. The colors were muted, not vibrant, and I found litter on the ocean floor. In fact, there was not one dive that I surfaced, surfaced from that week that my dive vest pocket wasn't filled with plastic trash. What I didn't know then was that those dull coral reefs and unplanned ocean litter pickups were a sign of a much bigger problem. The corals were slowly dying due to ocean acidification and the plastic trash was only a microcosm of the vast amounts of plastic finding its way into our oceans and being discovered in gyres all over the globe. That experience bothered me for a long time. I continued to recycle and pick up trash, but every time I shopped and filled my cart with non-recyclable plastic packaging, I felt instinctively that it was not sustainable. Where was it all going? I knew there was no away. Then one day, a few years ago, a, a book title caught my eye. It was a Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson. I picked it up and read it. This lady and her family of four live in Northern California and managed to create a ball jar of trash a year. That's this much. Now, I knew that wasn't possible for me and my family in North Carolina, but I was inspired to do better. 
I learned that my county's landfill was projected to hit capacity in 2040 and that there was no plan B. I started taking baby steps to decrease my family's landfill contributions by living a toward zero waste lifestyle. And to help others interested in doing the same, I co-founded the organization Toward Zero Waste in 2016. Five years later, my family has baby stepped ourselves into producing much less waste. In fact, in 2019, I decided to do what I called my green bin challenge. I wanted to know how long it would take our family of four to fill our 95 gallon curbside bin, the one you see there. The answer, as it turned out, was almost a year. That year, we rolled the bin to the curb one time at the end of November, just before Thanksgiving. Now, many people equate zero waste with anti-plastic and there is some truth to that, but plastic is not really the enemy. Plastic is a miracle material and a valuable resource, but we should be treating it as such. Plastic has made life-saving advances in medicine possible. It's made things possible in technology or transportation, recreation that we could not have imagined. It's made modern life possible. The problem with plastic is our incessant demand and mindless use of single-use plastics and pack packaging. And this problem has really only existed for about 70 years, less than the average lifetime. Industrial scale plastic production and consumption really only began in the 1950s. But in that relatively short time, around 8.3 billion tons of plastic have been produced worldwide. That's staggering. And except for what's been incinerated, it's all still here today. Single use plastics can be defined as any item made from plastic, a material derived from fossil fuels that will take hundreds of years to break down in nature and will never break down in a landfill but it's designed to be used once and discarded. Disposable plastic straws, plastic cutlery, plastic plates, plastic cups, these are all plastics that are thrown away after sometimes less than 15 minutes of use. To me, that is insane. Fortunately, the world's waking up to the single-use plastics problem. Collins Dictionary named single use the word of the year for 2018, citing a fourfold increase in use of that word since 2013. And National Geographic took on a long-term commitment to raise awareness with a deep dive into the issue of plastics in the environment. They kicked off their Plastic or Planet campaign in June of 2018 with this issue. And at the same time, they stopped packaging the magazine in a plastic bag. Plastic has also made headlines as a stat of the year for, the 2000, for, for 2018 from Great Britain's Royal Statistical Society. That stat, is 90.5. This is the percent of the world's plastic waste that has never been recycled. Now the statistics on plastics are almost incomprehensible, but here are a few more. Every second, 1,500 bottles of water are consumed in America. Of the 50 billion bottles consumed in a year, 80% end up in landfill. 32% of Seven of the 78 million tons of plastic packaging produced annually is left to flow into our oceans. This is the equivalent of pouring one garbage truck of plastic into the ocean every minute. And you've probably all heard this one, at the rate we're going, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Every day we have new photos of animals being harmed by our plastic problem. Another report of dead whales with bellies full of plastic, straw damaged turtles, and now even plastic found on the bottom of the ocean in the deepest depth we have been able to explore. There are also the human health impacts of components of plastics like phthalates and the infamous BPA. Over 4,000 chemicals can be found in plastics. Most of them are unre unregulated and have not been adequately tested for effects on human health. Of those tested, many have been found to be endocrine disruptors, cause liver and immune system damage and cancer. And whether it's chemicals leaching from plastic containers or microplastics shed from clothing, plastics are being found in our food, water, and air, and now, in our bodies, including in our blood and the breast milk of nursing mothers. Back when the world really began waking up to the problem of single-use plastics, you remember that poor turtle with the unlucky straw of his nose who came the post, became the poster child for all single-use plastics? 
Many thought it was only about litter in the ocean, but that we had bigger fish, fish to fry, namely climate change. But we now know that plastics, especially single-use plastics, are contributors to our changing climate. In 2015, worldwide production of plastics exceeded 300 million metric tons. And all along the product's life cycle, even long after it's been discarded, plastics creates greenhouse gases that contribute to the warming of our planet. Extraction of fossil fuels, including land disturbance of, of building pipelines, transportation, refining, manufacturing, and management of plastic waste, including recycling and incineration, are all carbon intense practices. Now back to that project projected statistic about plastic up of numbering fish in the ocean. It's not just about having a clean ocean. Our oceans actually play a huge role in carbon drawdown. There is growing evidence that these plastics broken down by light are disrupting the natural process by which the ocean acts as the largest natural carbon sink on the planet. I love this piece of artwork um, by Wilmington, North Carolina resident and plastic ocean project founder, Bonnie Mantelloni. If you wanna support ocean clean, clean, off, off, clean up off the coast of North Carolina, please go to plasticoceanproject.org and find out how you can help. But while the world may have woken up to the problem of plastics, the plastic industry has not. In fact, though I had been under the illusion that this zero waste movement, the one that's become such a part of my life and mission, surely meant that the tides are, are changing and that single use plastic is becoming less and less popular, the plastics industry is only increasing production. I'd highly recommend you watch uh, the story of plastic to find out how petrochemical companies like Dow, DuPont, Exxon, and Chevron have recognized the forthcoming decrease in fuel consumption from the transportation sector and changed tack. Seeing their fortunes tied to the manufacturing of more and more plastics, they are actually ramping up plastic production just when we need to be doing the opposite. When I heard this, I began digging into it. As it turns out, the availability of cheap shale gas through fracking in the United States is fueling a massive wave of new investments in plastics infrastructure, with $164 billion planned for over 200 new facilities or expansion products, projects in the U.S. alone, including one right down the road from us in neighboring Winston-Salem. Now, the COVID crisis has not helped. In fact, in only the first couple of months of the pandemic, contributions to the South Wake landfill were up by 20%. And with the perception that plastic rate wrapped and single use items were safer, much of this is plastic waste. But as far as the CDC is aware, there have been no documented cases of COVID-19 caused by touching a contaminated surface. Scientists have been saying this since last May, However, the CDC only recently updated its guidance to reflect this data. Hopefully this will translate into eliminating the perception that single-use plastics are safer than reusables because it's simply not true. Now, it may seem overwhelming to have looked at the scope of this problem and think that you can do anything about it, but I encourage you to be moved to action, not indifference. I'm here to tell you that one person can make an impact on your friends, on your family, on your neighbors, on your school, on your church, your community, even and especially on local government. So start with you. Now I wanna speak a minute about personal versus collective or structural ac action. As I mentioned in my introduction, my taking personal action has been an important part of my journey. By moving towards zero waste in my life, I've aligned my actions and values. It's relieved a cognitive dissonance within me, and that feels good. But I recognize that not everyone is in a position to make such change, so I encourage folks to do what you can. But realize that there are things we can't do, not without help. This became exceedingly evident in this past year of pandemic when so many of my options for buying without packaging were taken away in the interest of public health. And I was in complete agreement. We needed to figure out how this virus was spreading. But by May, scientists were saying that surfaces weren't a major vector for spread and that single use plastic everything was not a solution. It became one crisis contributing to another. 
When dining was no longer safe and takeout and delivery blew up, I knew that most of the packaging being used was not sustainable. So much of the takeout trash we're creating, and I'll add to that single-use masks, will remain in landfills indefinitely. This is a photo of one of our volunteers, Kaylee Cross. With a week's notice, she asked people to donate plastic-wrapped cutlery that they had collected from takeout. In two hours, she got 228 pounds of cutlery, or an estimated 10,000 packs. This is why top-down collective change is essential, but often it takes grassroots effort to push that top-down change. More on that later. Now back to the steps you can take, because action is empowerment. I'm not going to go into detail on each of these in the interest of time, but here's a primer, primer for moving towards zero waste. In decreasing your landfill contributions, awareness is the first step. Just becoming aware of the problem will help you to become more mindful. You'll begin to notice unnecessary plastic everywhere. You'll begin to ask yourself if you need that straw, coffee stirrer, lid, or plastic bag. And you might. That's mindfulness. But I encourage folks to not only become more mindful, but to become more intentional as well. Intentionality around your waste begins with understanding the waste you make. That's why we recommend doing a trash audit. Over a period of a couple of weeks to a month, investigate what you and your family throw away and recycle. Yep, I'm asking you to dumpster dive in your own trash. For a trash audit, some folks like seeing the visual of their trash, so they'll categorize it on a large tarp. A little bit easier is to list categories on a piece of paper and tick them off as you move from one receptacle to another. This process is how I learned that my family used tons of paper towels, and that solution was pretty simple. We put the paper towels on a high shelf in the pantry, so we had to think before reaching for them. Another intentional step you can take is to find out exactly how waste is managed in your municipality by scheduling a tour of your local recycling facility, landfill, or even water treatment facility when they open to tours. Seeing a materials uh, recovery facility, or MRF as it's called, will help you understand why it's very likely that some of what you think is being recycled may not actually be. For instance, at our facility, paper smaller than an index card and small plastic uh, or glass bottles simply fall through the rollers to the facility floor below, where they are bulldozed into a pile destined for landfill. Going, to a, going on a MRF tour is how I learned that no plastic cup not Starbucks, not even Solo, is recyclable in my town. And it's very likely that it's not recyclable in your town either. Now, we've all heard of reduce, reuse, and recycle. But have we ever stopped to ask what those words mean or why they're in that order? Even from the very beginning of the recycling movement, recycling was meant to be the last step, not an automatic go-to. We were first meant to reduce what we need, reuse what we can, and then and only then, use recyclable items and ensure that they get recycled at end of life. The zero waste movement adds two R's to this list, refuse and rot. Let's start at the top. Refusing is the first place where conscious consumerism makes an impact. Consumerism isn't just about what you buy, but it's about what you accept in your life because anything you accept into your life creates more demand for that thing. These are personal decisions. For me, this means preemptively and kindly refusing gifts, especially the Southern practice of hostess gifts. There's the birthday goodie bag, swag bag, freebies, samples, and that exciting bag of dentistry items that I was getting every six months from my dentist. And junk mail. Not an easy tackle, but once we whittled down our recycling because of our purchasing choices, we found that the greatest portion of our paper recycling was junk mail that never even made it into the house. This is where straws, uh, lids, stirrers, plastic bags, all these come in, and packaging. In our society, refusing packaging is hard. It can mean either going without certain products or learning to make your own, or doing a bit of research and finding out how you can, res how you can resource package free food and items locally. The second of the five zero waste uh, Rs is reduce. This simply means reducing what you do need or as my kids studied in third grade economics, looking at needs versus wants. How much of what you think you need is actually a want, and how many of those wants will you feel lighter never having had? 
The second R also encompasses reducing amounts of what you need. Owning more stuff means replacing, repairing, and storing, all of which can lead to more purchasing. Reducing also helps you prioritize quality over quantity and experiences over stuff. It's evaluating your consumerism to ensure that your shopping habits align with the, your values and the life that you wanna live. Reuse. Now this is where the real impact of a zero waste lifestyle comes in because reusing is the antithesis of single use. This R consists of my favorite zero waste practices, refill and bring your own. The power of reusing comes through habit building. Remembering to bring your own refillable bags, containers, coffee cup, water bottle, even cutlery kit takes practice. And you must be gentle with yourself in the process. I finally realized that the only way I would remember to bring my own whatever every time was to have a spot in my kitchen where all the reusables were stores and to create a car kit. My cup, cutlery kit, baskets, bag, olive oil, container, peanut butter jar, beer, beer growler, all go right back in the car once they're empty and clean. Reuse also includes repair. I love the concept of a repair culture and pushing back against the practice of planned obsolescence. Repair cafes are popping up all over and have become very popular. People are learning how to repair their own items and demanding that companies provide them the parts to do so. Reuse also includes repurposing items. I got to admit, I struggle with this. Maybe I don't have a good imagination or maybe I'm not a very good engineer or maybe it's that I need everything to match, but I do pretty well at repurposing wrapping paper and ribbons. Reuse also includes sharing. This can be a hard concept for Americans, but libraries of things are beginning to merge in some places, including one at my church that allows people to check out silverware for large events. Lastly, reuse includes buying used. Now this I do excel at. I love buying consignment and secondhand and do this for almost all the clothes I buy. Uh, the fourth R, recycle. It is complicated. Often when folks learn that we try to live a zero waste lifestyle, they begin to tell me how much they recycle, even saying that they actually fill two bins instead of one. But with a zero waste mindset, you actually recycle less not more. And that's what I'm going to ask you to consider doing, recycle less. Sounds a little crazy coming from someone concerned about landfills, but the truth is that only 9% of recyclable plastics actually end up being recycled. Now I know what you're thinking, well, at least my plastics are in that 9%. I always recycle. But did you know that just throwing your recyclable water bottle in the bin is no guarantee that it will become something, anything other than landfill trash? And even if that bottle does get recycled, did you know it actually doesn't become another water bottle? It's not as much recycling as it is downcycling. That statement, the one about the uncertainty of where your recycling actually ends up has been true for a long time. But the problem got worse in January of 2018 when China, the number one contributor of ocean trash, decided to stop taking the world's contaminated recycling. Here's the backstory. For years, U.S. demand for Chinese-made plastics had been high, so container ships would bring us our plastic trinkets and return to China empty. Then someone got to thinking, why not send our recycling to China to be processed? They need our raw materials and we have way too much. So that worked great for decades, kind of. The problem is that much of American collection systems went to single stream or mixed commingling. This made it easier for the consumer. We just chuck it all in the bin, but it makes for a contaminated product. I don't mean contaminated with food, although there is that, but contaminated with other recyclables or non-recyclables. And with tons of our garbage showing up on their shores, many places in China just didn't have the infrastructure to process it. In many cases, villagers being paid to pull out the good stuff had nowhere to put the contamination. So it would end up in the river and eventually in the ocean. So while China was the number one contributor of ocean trash, one has to, rem ha has to wonder how much of that trash was actually ours to begin with. Although they gave us plenty of warning, China's decision threw the world into chaos. Suddenly municipalities that had managed their recycling seemingly flawlessly were scrambling for where to put the recycling that was piling up in their facilities. Traditionally, very green states like Oregon were seeing much of their collected recycling being pushed into landfills. 
Some municipalities found new foreign places to send their recycling, but with the Ocean Conservancy claiming that China, in addition to China, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand, and Vietnam together were responsible for as much as 60% of the plastic waste that enters the world's seas, this doesn't seem like much of a solution. My town of Cary, North Carolina, never sent any of our recyclables to China or anywhere else, but the move has affected us too, because with so much commodity on the market, the price has dropped enough to quadruple our cost of rec recycling. My town used to make a little money recycling, now we pay. We've switched recycling companies to cut costs. We have a three-year contract, but town staff are still scrambling for solutions because while recycling is important to our community members, it's simply no longer affordable. Recycling is in trouble. But you can help by recycling right. The less contamination in the bin, the more likely the facility can find a buyer for their product. One resource to help you with this is Recycle Right NC. If you can't find the answer to your recycling question, just remember this, when in doubt, throw it out. In the long term, I think China's decision to stop accepting the world's waste will have been a good one. It forces us to deal with an issue that we have literally been burying and will force the industry to come up with better, more sustainable long-term solutions. Rot or composting. Composting is turning food waste or anything that was once alive into soil through a natural process that involves decomposers and heat. It can be done industrially or in your backyard. Wake County even has a drop off for food scraps at some convenience centers. So if you live in an apartment, this might be a great choice for you. If you take anything from this talk, let it be this. Composting has such incredible impact on the environment and on ourselves, some of which we're just beginning to understand that we should all be composting all of our food waste. If you have read the excellent and inspiring bestseller Drawdown, I highly recommend it, you will know that prevention of food waste is number three on the list of climate solutions. And in the US, 40% of food produced is wasted while one in six are hungry. So while preventing food waste should always take priority, this is a place that I need to work on, composting food waste while coming in at number 60 on the drawdown list is hugely impactful as well, especially when you use the finished product. Not only does keeping it out of our landfill prevent the release of methane, but spreading finished compost actually pulls carbon into the ground back where it belongs. So, Aside from keeping food waste out of our landfills and drawing down carbon from the atmosphere, what else can composting do? Well, using finished compost in land management helps soil retain more water, lowering watering, watering needs in times of drought and preventing runoff in heavy rains. In agriculture, it adds nutrients to the soil, increasing the nutrition of our food and eliminating the need for fertilizers. In turf management, Compost added over time decreases the impact of head injuries in playing fields and decreases the need for herbicides on golf courses, parks, and yards, all while pulling carbon back into the ground where it belongs. I just think it's a miracle. Composting is inexpensive, low tech, and solves multiple problems. And it's a resource we are already making every day. Most of us are simply wasting it. So if you aren't already doing it, I hope you will find a way to incorporate composting into your life. It is really just getting back to nature's original design. And I'll just put a plug right now for Kiss the Ground. If you haven't seen it, it's a great documentary. Our organization showed it last night. Find it at kisstheground.com or see it on Netflix for free if you have it. And it's only a dollar on, on, uh, on the website. Okay, so aside from lifestyle changes, one of the most important things you can do right now is to support legislation that that helps us tackle the problem of waste and encourages other and encourage others to do the same. At the moment, uh, both North Carolina state and national legislation have been introduced, which is really exciting. On the state level, there are a couple of bills recently introduced concerning plastic waste. The last time legislation was introduced on this was in 2019. It passed nearly unanimously in the House, but then died in the Senate. So we need to let our senators know that it's time for action on this. And on the national level, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2021 was recently introduced and outlines practical plastic reduction strategies to realize a healthier, more sustainable, and more equitable future. 
It is the most comprehensive set of policy uh, solutions to the plastic pollution crisis introduced uh, in Congress to date. So we really wanna, wanna support that. It is great to finally see some real movement on these issues, but please contact your elected officials on the local, state, and national level to let them know that action on this matters to you. They need to hear from their constituents. Now, remember that giant pile of cutlery that my colleague collected? Grassroots, grassroots social media campaigns have devel developed to tackle that issue. Hashtag cut out cutlery focuses on encouraging food ordering and delivery apps like Uber Eats, Postmates, and Grubhub to provide an opt-in option for cutlery instead of having restaurants automatically add the silverware to every order, even when you're eating at home. Then hashtag skip the stuff by upstreamsolutions.org National Reuse Network is pushing city, county, and state legislatures to enact policies that require restaurants to ask first before adding all that unnecessary stuff to your order. Getting social is a great way to spread the word about moving towards zero waste. I also want to make a quick mention of a Chapel Hill based organization. I don't have a slide on it, but it's called uh, Kai Blada. Um, recycling, K-A-Y-B-L-A-D-A.com. They have a new um, program that's a plastic credits like carbon offsets. So if you aren't able to get rid of all of your plastic, you can buy credits that help um, clean up uh, areas of Haiti and create jobs. Now, since this event is STEM-based, I wanna take a look at some of the innovation happening in the world of zero waste. I have to be honest with you, I tend to gravitate toward old school solutions versus new tech to answer many of our problems on waste. More what my grandmother did than Joan Jetson. Solutions like composting, right to repair, growing your own, and simply using less appeal to me. I love the old WW2 adage, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. But I understand that many of my preferred solutions would take a huge societal shift. And though this year has proven that humanity can change tack quickly when needed, getting our society to slow down, own less, do less, and be content is a really hard sell. It's going to take all of us pulling in the same direction to tackle the environmental issues we face. Stable climate, clean water, clean air, and healthy soil depend on everyone working together. So it will take old school mentality and new innovation. It's gonna take not only scientists, inventors and activists, but entrepreneurs, CEOs, banks, moms, granddads, economists, council members, board members, small business owners, landscapers, the list goes on. We need to understand what is necessary and all pitch in to make the shift. Moving towards zero waste on a large scale means embracing a circular economy. In our current system, we mine raw materials and process those materials into a product that is discarded after use. It is a take, make, waste cycle. In a circular economy, we would close the loop on all these raw materials. This is more than just recycling. It's considering the value of all the materials through their entire life cycle. In a circular economy, we consider the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. Profit alone would no longer be the sole measure of success. Moving to a circular economy is gonna take innovation. It's a para paradigm shift for all sectors. My husband who got a master's in engineering many years ago was never taught to consider the end of life of the materials he used. Cost, strength, durability, and conditions of the material um, where it would function were among the considerations, but what would happen at end of life was not. Moving to a circular economy means rethinking everything. And fortunately, there are people out there doing just that. Some of my favorite examples of a circular economy in action are reuse models. There are several of these across the country, including one right here in Durham, North Carolina. Crystal Dreisbach of Don't Waste Durham created a reusable takeout container system called Green to Go, which allows users to check out a container from participating restaurants via an app and then return them on uh, to various return kiosks or to the restaurant where they are taken to a central washing facility to clean. Other programs across the country have tackled those plastic cups. You remember your Starbucks cup, the Solo cup, it's all trash. Two programs that solve the disposable cup issue by using durable stainless steel cups are Vessel Works, available in Boulder and Berkeley, and Foreverware in Minneapolis. Foreverware also does stainless takeout containers that can be returned to participating restaurants to be sanitized. 
Stainless steel is a great choice for reuse because of its durability. These businesses all have slightly different models depending on community needs and are adaptable and scalable. Another innovative solution is Loop. Loop is a reusable grocery delivery service that delivers grocery, groceries, mostly dry goods and household items, in returnable, reusable containers. Even the box it comes in is reusable. Refillables are great, but environmentally speaking, local is always better. There are grocery stores that allow you to bring your own reusable container, some of the mainstream stores. And then there are these incredible package free stores where everything is bought in refillable containers. We have several in North Carolina. Quick shout out to Fillery in Durham um, for all your soap and lotion needs and to Rooted Reuse, offering monthly, um, a monthly stand at the Raleigh Market with lots of refill options. Now let's move on to tech tool innovation. There are several problem solving apps that I love. The first is plastic, plastic score, excuse me. This app like Yelp for food packaging waste allows customers to rate restaurants based on how sustainable, sustainable their packaging is. Reusable items or bring your own rate highest while uh, single use items rate low. The great thing about this app is that it educates customers and restaurant owners on best choices. You can create a group or join a group. And if you wanna join our group, you can use the code uh, TZW. Secondly is Literati. Based right here in the research triangle, Literati is a global app that inspires individuals and communities to pick up trash by making it social. See some litter, take a photo, tag it. My favorite tag is to tag the brand and then hashtag is this yours. And the app uh, geotags it so that you can see the impact of litter being picked up in real time all over the world. Data can even be used to encourage companies and governments to create positive policy changes. Groups, groups can create teams and collaborate or for a little fun compete with others. A third app I love is Share Waste. There are tons of people all over needing more food scraps for their compost piles or backyard chickens. And even more people with food scraps to share and know where to put them. The Share Waste apps bring these folks together by finding someone near you so that together you can build soil. Now, next are gonna be a few engineering and science-based solutions that are either in production or in the pipeline. One of the most intriguing solutions that I found was called biofabrication, which comes from a partnership between clothing designers and biologists. Together, they are experiment <coughs> experimenting with growing clothing and other materials out of bacteria, algae, fungi, and yeast, instead of processing plants, animals, or oil to make materials. Instead of taking months and lots of inputs, waste, and processing, this method takes days. Another example of biofabrication comes from a biotech company called Evocative Design, which is making vegan leather and styrofoam-like packaging out of lab-grown mycelium, which are the roots, uh, root structures of mushrooms. This is a true circular solution. To manage our broken recycling system, the UK recycling firm Mura Technology claims to have found a way to break down any type of plastics currently destined for the landfills or incineration. While I don't really believe that we can recycle our way out of this problem, Hydro PRS, as it's called, offers the potential to prevent the need for production of virgin plastics, which is fantastic. To clean up the mess we've already made, an 18-year-old Dutch kid named Boyan Slat designed a floating ocean cleaner. His design got, garnered a lot of criticism in the beginning. It was deemed unfeasible by some experts, and honestly, it didn't work at first. But he went back to the drawing board, and now at 26, his company, The Ocean Cleanup, has several vessels successfully working to clean up our ocean garbage and intercept trash going into some of the world's most polluted rivers. Now, sachets made from seaweed, microbes becoming clothes, plastic eating wax worms, chemical recycling, fermentation, these are all possible solutions to our waste problem. And to encourage um, more funding innovation, <clears throat> challenges and prizes have been created. In 2017, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation initiated a circular design and circular materials challenge. And if you wanna learn more about the circular economy, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website is a great asset, a great resource for you. Similarly, last October, Prince William and Sir Walter Attenborough joined forces to offer the Earthshot Prize. 
These earth shots are intended as universal goals to repair our planet by 2030. And we'll go to the best and most innovative ideas to help fix our climate, protect, protect and restore nature, clean our air, revive our oceans, and build a waste-free world. As I mentioned before, I am inclined to old school solutions. I tend to pause and question some of the solutions we come up with, which solve one problem, but possibly create another. Take compostable bioplastics, for example. They're being found not to break down so reliably in commercial compost and have been coined regrettable solutions by the folks at Upstream. They solve one problem, but create another. We, we have to approach solutions, understanding the big picture and the wider impact. I called on Stacy Glass, at um, uh, my, a friend of mine and executive director at Kim Ford, which is a collaboration working to advance safer chemistry in product design and manufacturing, to ask what she thought about some of the newfangled solutions. And here's what she had to say. She said, this is a crisis and nothing should be off the table. We need to be fearless in trying. There is no right answer. Along with the good work that you and we do, science and engineering is one very powerful way out of this. So let's hit this thing from all angles, old school solutions and new innovation. You know, one day I hope to return to Kotal and find those colorful, uh, color, colorful colors and ocean floor I expected. I know that hard work is now being done in that corner of the world to fight plastic pollution and to, to clean up the ocean and rebuild the coral whilst to warming waters. I want to inspire you to act today in your corner of the world to start decreasing the waste you make, encourage others to do the same and asking for structural change. And if you are so inclined and so inspired, think big. You just might have the piece of the puzzle to move us towards zero waste. And working together, imagine the impact that we could have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. That was um, really inspiring and kind of um, eye-opening, I know, to me and hopefully other people um, are going to be looking a little bit closer at the way um, they are, you know, using items and producing trash and even thinking differently a little bit about recycling. I know that, um, you know, when you, when you think that something is being recycled, it doesn't hurt as much. It doesn't feel as bad as, you know, oh yeah, I'm using it one time, but it's going to be recycled. It's going to be reused. But yeah, you're right. A lot of resources go into, even if the item is recycled, um, you're talking about, you know, a fairly big carbon, um, output um, from, from that process. So it's important to think about the whole process uh, along the line. And so I do have a question for you personally. So I also live in Cary. Um, and so I want to know, like, how, what is the first step that we can take? What's the easiest step to, you know, how do we find those places that, you know, you can bring a bag in and feel, fill it with, you know, pinto beans or rice or yeah. something like that instead of going to the store and just buying a big bag that's wrapped in plastic right um, so yeah. yeah so what is the where where are those resources how can I find that so that is um exactly why I started this organization because I um I did kind of figure it out on my own and then I started going shopping and I noticed I was the only one doing it um mm -hmm. So I created, I started with a meetup group and it became um, some Facebook groups. So in Cary, we have a Facebook group called Toward Zero Waste Cary. And it's got about um, somewhere between 12 and 1400 members. We also have one in Raleigh. We have about 17 across the state. And so I would say the first step would be to join one of those groups. If you're on Facebook, if you're not on Facebook, I don't recommend, I don't recommend <laughs> getting on Facebook. I, I think, um, you know, if, if you're there, great. But if not, let, let's find you another option. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a place where people can share exactly that information. You can go and say, hey, where, who, who's found um, pasta in bulk somewhere and find out. Now this year, it's been really hard because even at, at uh, you know, our Bastion Whole Foods that had a pretty big um, refill station, they severely cut back. Uh, but we hope we're, they're going to be, um, you know, opening that up again soon. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to, um, you know, you know, take some steps in the right direction. Yeah, and, um, it, and it, you know, I think one thing that we have done is we, um, when we gather, when we're, when we're meeting together, we will have um, a grocery store, um, 
outing. And so what we would actually meet at the grocery store and some of our stores have community rooms like the old earth fair did. And, um, literally walk through the grocery store together and just show you how to do it. Because I remember the first time I went in with my own bags and my own jars. And, you know, just today I was at the grocery store and filled up my peanut butter jar and I mean, it's nothing. I don't even think about it now, but when I first did it, it was a little daunting. Like who's watching me? Am I doing it right? You have to, um, learn how to tear weight something or have the tear weight already written on it. And a lot of grocery stores um, know how to do this, but it, it can be a little scary if you get up to the up to the counter and the person behind the counter says, oh, what is this? All you have to do is ask for the manager because the manager always knows how to tear weight. So you just very kindly say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm trying to decrease my plastic. And so I'm, I'm bringing my own and, um, and they'll know how to do it. No, that's fantastic. Cause yeah, there definitely is an intimidation factor mm -hmm. trying new things, especially going into, you know, a grocery store and like never seeing it done, never doing it. And, um, so I appreciate that kind of community help. I know when my um, son was born, you know, I had all these like big plans to cloth diaper him. And those first few weeks, I was just completely overwhelmed and terrified until I went to my first like mom group meeting and other people were like, oh, it's easy. This is how you do it. And from then on, just watching somebody do it in real life, no matter how many videos I watched, I was like, oh, great. Fantastic. Yeah, that's <laughs> and amazing. And, and cloth diapering was my, um, kind of my first foray, I guess, in the zero waste. I did the same. It was really, really cool, really cool. To, and it was, it was that feeling of thinking, you know, actually I was, I was cloth diapered most of my babyhood, mm -hmm. but my mom did, we, they got a little bit of money. They'd buy some pampers and, um, you know, so there are diapers out there somewhere, somewhere there's diapers that I wore. And that is very, <laughs> um, you know, that's really makes you think about about what you're doing when you're just tossing something into the landfill that, that everything that you've thrown away is still out there somewhere. Yeah. And I know you mentioned, um, you know, earlier about, you know, taking a tour of these waste facilities and I haven't had a tour of a recycling facility yet, but, um, we did go on a, a tour with some, some of my coworkers to the, um, South Wake landfill. And it is amazing. Just the pro like, if you don't really know how a landfill works, you know, you can learn. And just, we stood on top of <laughs> this big hill that they had kind of sealed up already and just watched, um, you know, these big semi trucks completely like full size semi trucks with compacted trash row after row, just like endless streams of, of garbage being dumped in. And, um, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable the amount yeah. of trash is produced. And if you think like, oh, like my little bag of trash isn't making a difference, think about all the people who live around you, all your neighbors and expand that to other neighborhoods and all of, you know, your city or your county. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And then, um, you know, we had someone from the landfill come and give a talk at the museum and she like had a bag of trash from the eighties and it had a perfectly preserved banana peel in it. And this, I mean, this is a 30 year old banana peel and yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's perfectly preserved. It's still yellow. And so, um, you know, you think like, oh, it's a banana peel. It's going to decompose, but at the landfill, it doesn't. So I'm um, really thinking about what you're throwing in the trash. They, they put it in the conditions and that's why the, the, the composting is so important. It's really the most impactful thing you can do is composting. And then you suddenly you have dry trash and that's what enabled us to, to leave our trash in the garage for, for 11 months was everything was dry. There was nothing in there that was um, rotting or smelly or anything. So yeah, composting is, is a great, it's a great thing if you can do it. Um, and, you know, in, in Cary, uh, we're, we're, our little organization is pushing um, to dry curbside compost. It's not, it's not an easy push, but um, we're making, we're making steps. There's some baby steps and some uh, little things that are going on that you'll be hearing about soon. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I am, I'm lucky enough to have a yard that I can compost in. And so I am, um, I actually just had to move my compost bin because it's a little bit shady, so it doesn't compost very quickly. But um, so I've been like spreading that compost all over my yard where I, you know, just adding some nutrients back into my yeah. soil and into my your garden beds. Nutrients and you're drawing down carbon. It's really, I think it's amazing. And I've, I've, I've gotten very excited about, about compost and what it can do um, and, and how it's just such a, we've got these huge looming environmental uh, issues. And this is such a simple solution, you know, and so, um, getting our, getting the towns and there, there are many cities across 
across the country who are doing curbside compost already. And so um, it's doable and it's um, part, of, part of what we need to do is close the loop. So not only making the compost, but using the compost. And so when we talk to different um, councils or staff at, at, at towns, we, we talk about um, using compost, whether you're doing it on playing fields or on the side of the road or wherever um, to help create that business. And it's, it's a big job creator as well. Yeah, I know that the museum, we started composting in the past couple of years. Yay. Um, yeah, and um, in our cafes, we got it going and we work with Compost Now and, um, you know, their program, you know, however much compost you produce, you know, they say, oh, we can, we'll give it to a community garden of your choice. And so mm -hmm. it is being put back into the system. And I, you know, I, as far as compost goes, I, I was talking to a girl and she was maybe eight years old, eight or nine years old, and um, about, this is vermicomposting with worms. And, you know, I was explaining to her how the process worked and she was like, oh, so it's like you, you know, the food, the plants grew and then you put the plants in and the worms break it down into those nutrients that the plants need again. And so new plants grow from those nutrients. And I was like, that's perfect. So it's <laughs> really just recycling those nutrients that those plants used to grow and giving it to other plants, which was fantastic. So it's nature's um, design. We love compost now. We had, I, I think I said that last night we screened Kiss the Ground um, through our organization. Um, and Kat <coughs> now is one of our panelists. She was just, she's just excellent. So pa pa uh, passionate and knowledgeable. And I'll say, um, you know, about teaching your kids. Uh, one of the things that I did way back in 2013 was I got a wild hair um, that I should start a school garden. I knew nothing about gardening, but somebody had said it, it was Jamie Oliver, if you know who, who that is, had said, you know, every school should have a garden. I said, of course it should. And so we started a school garden at my kids' elementary school. And, um, we have a three bin compost system there. We have a black bin, the traditional one like you have in your backyard, but we also have a three bin. And one of the things that we do is um, the families will bring in comp kitchen scraps from home, from their kitchens. So the kids see that going in. And at first I would be real, you know, be sure don't let any plastic get in there, take the stickers off the fruit, make sure. Then I realized the kids are, are screening those compost at the end. We get a little sifter and they screen it and then we spread into the garden and they see the biggest lesson they have is that they see the things that go into the bin that aren't um, compostable never go away. And that's a real, that I just, I, I don't, I don't say anymore, be careful to pull all the plastic out because I want them to see it come out the other end because that really makes an impact that they see that it's been in here for six or however many months and it's not gone away. Yeah. That's great. And yeah, I, yeah, every now and then like a little twist tie or something I'll find in my compost that, you know, <laughs> this stuff's been there for years and years and yeah, that little twist tie just maintained itself. So, um, all right. And so, um, I think Ryan's feeling a little, <laughs> a little bit worried. So he said, what are we supposed to do? Will we ever actually get to zero waste? And, um, you know, I think you covered that a little bit, it, you know, baby steps and then just, yeah, pushing for those bigger changes is what's gonna make a, a big difference. It's well, and seeing this legislation, seeing it, um, that's very inspiring to me and that's what it's gonna take. And I think, um, you know, I came into this thinking, you know, we talk a lot about personal versus corporate action. And, and for me, as I said, it's very important for me to be a part of the solution. And, and I'm able to do that in, in, in my situation here, but so many people aren't. So that's why we have to push for greater change um, and, and equitable change. And so um, I think that I'm super encouraged that we have um, legislators that are even talking about it because four years ago they weren't. Um, and, and I remember, you know, when, when France started talking about banning um, plastic, I thought, oh, that'll never happen in the United States, you know, but, but, it, but it could, you know, we just have to find um, workable solutions, equitable solutions. Um, and, and I think, I, I'm hoping that we'll get there. And, you know, doing the research that I did for this particular presentation, that was a little more STEM based than I'm used to and looking into some of those solutions, it did encourage me. Um, on the one hand, I don't want people to get um, kind of, lackadaisical about it and think, oh, we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to turn all our trash into 
whatever, something else, because that's not really the solution. But, um, but being able to take things out of the ocean and then use them, the, the plastic trash, all the fishing nets that are out there in the ocean, if we can pull all that out and actually turn it into something else, that's a real solution. And that's, um, that's, that's, that's progress, uh, you know, but we, we have to close the loop. Yeah, I absolutely. And, um, you know, the fact that there's probably so much plastic trash in the ocean that we can make so much stuff. In it is, right. It's like, we it don't need to be volumes, making, right? Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to make any more plastic. We just have to figure out how to use what's already all out there. And, and that'll take years. All right. Well, we are um, getting close to the hour. So I'm going to wrap it up. Great. Um, I do want to say that Bob um, dropped a, a chat in the chat box about, um, he said there was a virtual tour of Raleigh's Recycle Center today at the same time as this presentation. So maybe keep an eye on their website um, to see if there's something like that, some other virtual tours that you can check yeah, out. But I, I don't know if Sarah was the one who did your tour, but she's fantastic. So the virtual tour, she's, uh, she and I have been talking. I'm excited that they're doing that. It's yeah, we might have to, have to partner up with them for a, a yeah. tour. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a really, she does a really good tour. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much again, Lee. And um, I hope that um, everyone who watches this presentation will be inspired. Um, you will see me in your Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a website. I, mean, I was going to say that this group is not the only way. Um, all our things come out, all our events come out on websites and, and it's all free. Yeah. But, and if you look, we have this presentation is being um, posted on YouTube. And so in the YouTube description, there will be lots of links to lots of things that you talked about and referenced today. So people can check that and including awesome. your website. Thank so, you. Yes. Thank, so you thank you very much. You so much. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone for coming today. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Biogen and um, NC SciFest. And to all of our members of the museum with our friends, presentations and programs like this wouldn't be possible. So we depend on you for a lot of things. And of course, all of our viewers and all of our participants, thank you so much. And we hope to see you. Um, we have a couple more presentations today during Earth Day. And then tomorrow on Friday and Saturday, we also have some more presentations to wrap up the Triangle SciTech Expo. So thank you again. We hope to see you in more presentations and have a great birthday. Bye. Happy Earth Day. Bye. <laughs>